welcome to the Pacific Research Institute podcast. I'm your host, Romina Itchon. In this episode, our guest is Chuck DeVore. Our listeners might remember him from his days at the California Assembly. Chuck is one of the many Californians who decided to move to Texas, where he now enjoys affordable housing and excellent quality of life, and as vice president of the Texas Public Policy Foundation, he can actually be more effective at changing policy than as a public official in California. We think you'll enjoy this. Thanks for joining us. Chuck, thank you so much for being a guest on PRI's podcast. So, you know, for us Californians, it's great to hear from you again after you've been gone for so long. Our listeners remember you as a state assemblyman and a U.S. Senate candidate. Catch our listeners up on what you've been doing since you left California. Well, that's a great question. I left California in December of 2011, so about a year after I termed out. In that time period, in that one-year period, uh, it was really kind of a difficult decision to make. My wife and I had to take in my aged in-laws, her parents. They both had dementia. They were from upstate New York. And in our relatively small house in Irvine, it was difficult to find room for everybody by putting two adults with some needs into the same house. And of course, the housing values being as what they are in California, it's like, gee, how are we going to make this work? We have an obligation to take care of these individuals and, and it's tough. And at the same time, the aerospace industry, where I had worked for 13 years before I was elected in 2004, all of the major headquarters where I had done my consulting work had vacated out of California, mostly gone to the Beltway area, but some to some states in the South where there were lower labor costs and land costs and less of a regulatory burden and a tax burden. And so, and then finally, you know, looking at the philosophical shift in California, I was thinking that that a place for a person like myself who believed in in a constitutional liberty and uh, ordered and limited government, that my idea we're just seeing less and less purchase in California. And so we came to the decision to move that was made a little easier by the fact that one of the guys on my campaign for Senate in uh, 2010 was a native Texan and had started working at the Texas Public Policy Foundation, which I hadn't heard of before, right? Because, hey, I'm a Californian, right? Who are these guys? And it ended up that they were one of the larger state-based free market uh, think tanks in the country. Uh, now I think we are with over 80 people. And so I moved out actually without even a firm job offer, they had contracted with me to write a book called The Texas Model, uh, which incidentally served as my due diligence for deciding to move the family to Texas. I looked at all the negative things that people said about Texas and and looked at U.S. Census Bureau data and and other objective sources of information and saw for myself just how true or false the the accusations were. And in virtually every case, they were just, you know, false charges hurdled at the Lone Star State. And so we picked up and moved. And uh, by golly, I tell you, it's something else to be in a place where my ideas are mainstream, not extreme. And where as a, a, a VP with a, a think tank, uh, two blocks from the state capitol, I'd say that I have more influence on passing good legislation than I ever did as an elected official in California. So that's the story in a nutshell. Chuck, you're kind of the real life example of what PRI and many think tankers and many free market folks in California talk about all the time. You know, the Californian who was so fed up, they actually picked up and and left. And so hearing your stories about how good things are in Texas, some of our listeners may undoubtedly be shopping for a moving company. You talked about the Texas model and you have personal experience on this front. So how much better? Better and cheaper are things for you and all the other ex-Californians now living in Texas? Well, it, it's a very different uh, sort of model. Obviously, people live in different places for different reasons, mostly, of course, for work and family. And every part of the country has its own advantages, its own unique uh, attraction. Uh, certainly, California, if you're fortunate enough to, to live within a short drive of the coast, is an amazing place to live. But in much of the rest of California, it's actually not that much different than it is in much of Texas, uh, being that it's it's hotter, uh, it's further from the coast, and more culturally conservative in the interior of California and Texas than on the coast. You know, it's interesting that you asked that question in the uh, in the years since my move to Texas. I, I've almost been like an individual Texas Chamber of Commerce because what's happened is people who knew of me through my my political career uh, and who were thinking about relocating would track me down and would call or email and grill me about uh, what things were like in Texas. And what I would typically do is schedule the time to talk with them on my commute home. 
and uh, spend 30 minutes with them on the phone, just answering their questions and chatting. And several of those folks ended up uh, relocating their business operations or liquidating and moving to Texas. And so the, the first thing you find is the housing values are much more reasonable. And that's due to a number of factors. As you well know, a number of studies have shown that the cost of a home in a place like California, about 40 to 60 percent of the cost could be attributed to regulation and environmental rules and taxes. It's not the raw land value and not the the value of the materials in the house or the labor. It's artificial scarcity and costs that have been imposed by government. And those things are in Texas as well, just a lot less of it. And therefore, when we moved in in our own individual case, uh, we purchased a house that was 70% larger uh, for $110,000 less. And instead of being on 0.1 acre, it was on 1.2 acres and we have our own swimming pool. And uh, I see deer in my my front yard just about every day. And of course, I also have to deal with raccoons that occasionally try to eat the things that I've got around. So I've got to trap those and remove them. You know, I'm enjoying things out in what's known as the Texas Hill Country, which is an area largely between San Antonio and Austin. A lot of Californians live there as well. And contrary to the fears of Texans, they're mostly conservative. Uh, There was a a poll done by the Texas Tribune in UT, uh, Texas, uh, about three, four years ago that showed that by a margin of 57% to 27%, the California diaspora in Texas was conservative over liberal. That makes a certain amount of sense when you think that most really committed liberals uh, would rather die than move to Texas. So check energy is another issue where our two states have different approaches. In a recent Forbes column, you wrote about how Texas is producing far more wind power than California at about half the price. To follow the left's caricature of both states, you would think the opposite is true. So what is Texas doing right and California doing wrong? What lessons can our policymakers learn from those in the Lone Star State when it comes to producing renewable energy more affordably? That's a great question. I, I think there's two parts to it. First of all, Texas, unlike California, successfully deregulated its electricity market, mostly deregulated. And I say that because they provided exemptions to uh, municipal power companies and co-ops. So for example, where I live, it's uh, served by the Pedernales Electric Cooperative. So I don't have electrical choice. People in Austin don't have electrical choice because it's served by the Austin Power uh, Company. But in more than 80 percent of Texas that's served by the Texas grid, which is about 85 percent of the the state, consumers have a choice. They can pick between uh, providers, electrical providers. And unlike the uh, half measure that California did back in the late 90s that ended up in the electrical crisis meltdown that was partially responsible for Great Davis's recall, uh, Texas went a step further and deregulated uh, a greater portion of the electrical market, thereby creating real competition. Critics of this immediately jumped on the fact that in the years right after uh, this happened, Texas's electricity costs went up and were above the national average. But that was the supply and demand working itself out. And very quickly, they plummeted. The, the electrical costs in Texas plummeted below the national average and have stayed there ever since. And, and today, what you find is a general rule is that the electricity, the, the electric, electrical rates for, for uh, industrial, for commercial, and for residential and and the overall blended rate in Texas are typically from 80%, you know, where California is 80% to 100% higher than in Texas. So about double. And so primarily that's been a function of the deregulation in Texas compared to in California, where you have a heavily regulated market with three big producers, right? You've got uh, San Diego Gas and Electric, which I think is owned by Sempra down in the southern part of the state. You have uh, Southern California Edison and the greater Los Angeles. Angeles area, and of course, the LA Department of Water and Power is the municipal utility. And then up north, you have, you have uh, PG&E, right? Pacific Gas and Electric. Now, those entities are heavily regulated by the Public Utilities Commission, and they're given a guaranteed rate of return. They make a profit no matter what. And as a result, they are incentivized perversely to have high electrical costs because the higher the cost of electricity, the more revenue they make, and the more revenue they make, the more profit they can make. That's not the way it works in Texas. And so that's the first problem. That's the first big issue is that California is a heavily regulated market and Texas is largely a free market. The next issue is that California politicians keep outbidding themselves to continue to increase the California renewable portfolio, which means that uh, California has to have increasing amounts of electricity from renewable sources of electricity, mostly wind and solar, but also biogas and geothermal and, and small hydro. The rules are so exact 
acting that in California, any hydro dam above 50 megawatts, which is a very small dam, doesn't even count as renewable, even though technically it is. And because of these onerous rules uh, that are driven by politics, that also creates a problem because these sources of electricity are intermittent. And even though the fuel costs are technically zero because the wind is free or the sunshine is free, the challenge is because it's not always sunny and it's not always windy, you have to pay to have backup. And that's usually in the form of a natural gas uh, powered facility. So you have to pay to build it, you have to pay to maintain it, uh, you have to pay the interest. And of course, the utilities love it because they get a guaranteed rate of return on building those facilities too. And so what ends up happening is the California consumer gets shafted. Uh, Now, if you're part of the liberal elite, that's less of a problem because you're likely, if you're part of the liberal elite in California, you're likely to live very close to the coast, where of course you have a very uh, low air conditioning bill and a modest heating bill. It's uh, generally the working Californians who are a little further away from the coast that have the high electrical bills and really pay the cost of these policies. Chuck, PRI recently conducted a survey of business executives who either left the Golden State or considered moving or expanding some or all of their operations here, but opted against it. And surprisingly, they ranked quality of life issues like education and housing costs as their primary reason for not coming to California. So how do our findings compare with what you're hearing from former California business owners who are now based in Texas? Well, they're onto something. Obviously, the quality of life issue, you know, how much a home costs is hugely important, not just for the business owner, but for their employees. Because if you have to lay out a lot of money just for shelter, whether you're renting or leasing or buying, that's less money that you have for other necessities, food, clothing, saving for your child's college education, your own retirement, things like that. And so that is a gigantic issue. And as a general rule, if you look at the cost of living indexes that are available, not only from the government, but also derived from government sources, you'll see that California, uh, as a general rule, is about 40% more costly than is Texas. That's a lot, right? That means that if you make uh, 10 bucks an hour in Texas, you need to make $14 an hour in California just just to have the same amount of money. Uh, and, and this leads to a host of other challenges. For example, teachers in California are generally among the highest paid in the country. It depends on the year. Sometimes the teachers in Washington, D.C. are paid more. Sometimes the teachers in New York are paid more. But usually uh, California is in the top three. But if you uh, look at the cost of living differential between California and Texas, where the Texas teachers uh, get paid a lot less on paper, uh, what you find is that the teachers are actually getting paid about the same when you take into account the cost of living in the two biggest states. And that's really important. And that's one of the reasons why California has among the highest classroom sizes in the country, because the teachers cost so much uh, that the state can't really afford, uh, doesn't want to prioritize having more of them in the classroom. Uh, Texas, on the other hand, has a a teacher to to student ratio that's actually better than the national average. And so it probably, I mean, I'm not saying that the the classroom ratio is the end-all be-all. There's obviously a whole host of other things that go into how students perform, but it certainly is a factor. Uh, And it's probably one of the reasons why, if you look at the uh, national assessment of educational progress from the Department of Education, you'll see that uh, in math and and reading at fourth and eighth grade by race and ethnicity, that as as a general rule, Texas outperforms California often by significant numbers. So much of what is written about the differences between California and Texas centers around taxes and regulations. Texas is doing well economically, but Governor Brown and defenders of the so-called California values point to the Golden State's economic growth despite high taxes and regulations. This doesn't seem to match up to the reality of, of what's going on in many of the California communities, especially in, in rural and inland parts of the of the state. What's your view on this? Are things not as bad in California as some would say, or are things actually much worse? Well, that, that, that also, that question itself shows great insight into what's going on. I describe uh, the California economy as something akin to a barbell, where you've got a tremendous amount of growth at, at either end, where, yes, there is an enormous amount of value be, being created in Silicon Valley, a lot of intellectual property. Uh, hopefully, some of it we can keep from being stolen by the Chinese, but, but nevertheless, it's an enormous amount of wealth that is being generated and is highly competitive all over the country. The problem is that that is affecting a very small geographic area and a relatively elite uh, 
slice of the California population that's benefiting from that. Not everybody can go to work for Google. Uh, not everybody uh, has the, you know, the intellectual capacity to provide value to these companies. And so then the question you have is, what are the rest of the Californians able to do for a living to put food on the table and to have a, a piece of the American dream? Uh, and the sad answer is increasingly less. So yes, California's GDP growth has been looking pretty decent in the last uh, few years, uh, primarily uh, because of Silicon Valley's success. Uh, the challenge is, is that the things that liberals claim that they care about, the, the things that progressives will tell you about, is that they want to see less poverty and they'd like to see uh, more income equality. And yet, California isn't doing well on income equality, even though they have the highest uh, marginal income tax rate in the nation at 13.3%. They have uh, significant amounts of redistributive uh, policies, uh, generous welfare policies, etc. And yet, it doesn't seem to help uh, at all. And in fact, the U.S. Census Bureau, after about 20 years of prodding uh, by Congress, eventually came out with a new way to measure poverty. And they publish it every year, but it's not used for any of the uh, divvying up of federal resources. It's called the Supplemental Poverty Measure. And unlike the official poverty measure that's been around since the early 1960s, the Supplemental does take into account state-by-state state cost of living differences, at least insofar as housing. And it also includes the value, the cash value of uh, welfare benefits that are not counted uh, in the official poverty measure. For example, food stamps are what's now known as Supplemental Nutrition Assistance uh, Program, as well as uh, Section 8 housing vouchers. Those are not counted in the official poverty measure, but they are in the supplemental. And by this new measure of poverty that's been published since 2009, California has had the highest poverty rate in the nation every year since this uh, measure was published in 2009. And interestingly enough, Texas has uh, typically been at or a little below the national average. And if you look at it today, in comparison, the two biggest states, California has, as I recall, 39% more people in poverty proportionately than does Texas. And what's amazing about that is California and Texas are really similar demographically. They're both minority majority states. In fact, Texas has a smaller percentage of white non-Hispanics than does California. So on paper anyway, you would expect that Texas might be struggling with its poverty rate. But in fact, it's uh, slightly below the national average. You know from your six years serving in the legislature that California has always marched to the beat of its own drummer, but it seems like even in the eight years now since you've been out of Sacramento that things have gone way off the deep end. Maybe there's a comparison between your leaving and things going way off the deep end. <laughs> Gee, thanks. And the legislature today seems more motivated by making political statements and protesting Donald Trump and promoting the craziest fringe causes than actually solving problems. So how do you explain it? Why are policymakers in California such an outlier when compared with the rest of the nation? Well, perhaps what's happening is the unintended consequences of the uh, top two primary system. That might be what's going on uh, in the sense that you have a different calculus when uh, you simply need to be one of the top two people in the first uh, process of the of the election and then followed by, of course, winning in November, that may have resulted in the legislature becoming even more liberal than it was before. Uh, that, of course, in getting rid of the supermajority to approve the budget uh, certainly uh, diminished the ability of the Republicans to uh, at least have a moderating influence on the budget process. But at the end of the day, I think a lot of these things are self-correcting. And in other words, when you when you are putting forward policies that end up having to compete against 49 other states and the rest of the world, and they have consequences with regards to capital formation and job creation and, and people being able to start families and, and building homes and things like that, eventually those policies are going to uh, have some serious negative repercussions. Uh, and eventually, uh, the voters, most of whom are pragmatic, are going to look at the results and say, you know, maybe this isn't working out for us and we need to elect some different types of people. I think that California is not immune 
to the laws of economics and of common sense, and that eventually this will uh, self-correct, and you'll start to see a different composition in the legislature, if not five years from now, 10 years from now. Uh, I don't think it can continue on indefinitely, though. Let's move on to, to culture. Uh, you wrote a column last year for the Sacramento Bee comparing Texas and California's culture. You explored just how fundamentally different the two states are, even though, as you say, they're, they're equally diverse. Both states have great people and lots of innovation and wealth, yet they couldn't be more different on so many levels. What do you think explains this wildly different outlook on life? That's really, I think, the subject of potentially several books. What I find fascinating first uh, with Texas is that because it's such a gigantic place and has very distinct sub-regions uh, within it, uh, it's really several states packed into one. The fact that Texas also was an independent nation for almost 10 years before it became a state really weighs significantly in the Texans' own perception about what it means to be a Texan and what Texas is. But I think that in general, you find a, a very keen appreciation for liberty liberty, for freedom, uh, you know, certainly a deep skepticism of the ability of government to do uh, everything. And so uh, I would say that in Texas, there's, there's just a lot more of a can-do spirit uh, for individuals to get out there and make their own way. And uh, frankly, because government is less onerous, government has less of a heavy regulatory hand, people can go out and make their own way. In fact, I, uh, as a quick vignette, uh, spoke to a, a couple of developers developers who have worked in both states uh, who told me that uh, to get permission to build, for example, just a modest strip mall in uh, Texas would take four or five months to get permission so that they could start to build, whereas the same uh, footprint of a mall, a uh, strip mall in California, would take four to five years before they could begin construction. And of course, all that translates into people who are not able to meet demand and who, who when the product is finally completed, the house or the office building or the strip mall, is going to be more expensive. And consumers obviously have to pay for that eventually. In the case of California, California's development was very, very different than in Texas. You had a very, very small population at the time uh, of California becoming a state and then this huge influx of people moving into the state for the global Gold rush and California obviously attracted people from all over the country and, and developed uh, kind of an interesting you know culture that was a fusion of, of people who had come from all over the nation and I think though that in the last 20 years you've seen a, a pretty interesting shift that has occurred since the end of the Cold War where a lot of the uh, skilled trades people that built uh, many of the the weapon systems that America used to win the Cold War ended up moving out of the state uh, when they're operating moved. And in fact, if you look at, at that opinion poll that I cited earlier that looked at the fact that over by two to one, people moving out of California to Texas were conservative. If you look at the domestic migration patterns that are published by the Census Bureau every year, uh, roughly speaking, about 550,000 people move out of California and about 450,000 move in. Well, if of the 550,000 that move out, if they're two to one conservative uh, and the place that they're mostly going to to, the, the plurality are moving to Texas, what that probably means is that conservative Californians are moving out of the state and they're not being replaced, at least not yet. And I, I think that also uh, tends to sharpen the cultural distinctions between the two biggest states. Finally, as evidenced by all the issues we've discussed today, there's been something of a big rivalry that has developed between California and Texas in recent years. We remember when Governor Perry would famously go on his fishing expeditions in California to try to recruit businesses and jobs to move to Texas, and Governor Brown has not been shy about responding to him and other Texas leaders with some choice words that we won't repeat on a family show here. So you've had had the advantage of living in both states. Why do you think there's such a rivalry between uh, Texas and California? Well, they're the two biggest states, right? And uh, the two most populous states. And there's a huge amount of uh, kind of cachet 
uh, in both of the states where uh, California has the Bay Area and has Hollywood, you know, these fantastic vistas. And, and then Texas has its own mystique with, uh, you know, longhorns and cowboys and oil derricks. And, and, you know, you ask about this rivalry, but what I found fascinating was um, a little over a year and a half ago, I was invited to go to Australia and meet with some 40 members of parliament to talk about conservative criminal justice reform. And uh, so I was down in Australia for about 10 days. But before I went, I said, look, you know, are you sure that you want me? I'm just a, I was just a state lawmaker. And while I, I run the effort here at the foundation and, and this 18 staffers that, that work under my guidance, I'm not one of our brand name people. You know, what if, what if you had the former attorney general from Ohio, you know, who's one of our signatories, right? He, he's, he's much more impressive with his background than am I, because he was the attorney general for a whole state. And the Australians replied, and it was really, it, it shocked me, but they said, in Australia, no one knows what Ohio is. Everybody knows what Texas is. And I was just dumbstruck by that comment, right? I mean, it's like, really? Oh, that's interesting. And so then when you think about it from a national standpoint, there's probably, you know, a few big states that really have their own significant mystique, if you will, uh, for most among them, California and Texas. You'd probably put Florida and New York on the list as well. But really, it, it's those two states. And, and I think the rivalry is real and, and useful because there are only four states that are majority minority, Hawaii and, and New Mexico and California and Texas. And the two states that look most like demographers tell us the future of America will look like are, in fact, California and Texas. And because both states have uh, diverse economies, they both have huge oil and gas resources reserves. It's just that California makes it difficult to exploit them. You know, you, you have these diverse populations, vast amounts of land. There's a lot to compare and, and a lot t- uh, to be gained from the comparison. And uh, lastly, I think because uh, Texas has been so successful in encouraging uh, businesses to consider either relocating or expanding in Texas versus California, I think that just adds to the sharpness of the current uh, uh, rivalry. So at this time at the end of our podcast, we traditionally ask our guests to share their favorite California wine recommendations. But many, many people know that Texas produces some great wine too. So what Texas wines do you recommend to Californians who are visiting or or God help us moving to the Lone Star State? Ah! That's terrible. So in the Texas Hill Country, there are numerous both wineries and microbrews, uh, as well as distilleries. It's a rapidly growing part of the local economy. And so what I would recommend is uh, a number of different uh, outfits. Uh, first of all, just recently opened up about half a mile from where I live. Uh, it's run by the uh, family that has some sort of a reality television show that I certainly have seen, but I, I've, I've heard is like a big deal. It's like Supernatural uh, is, I think, the name of the show. And they just opened up a place about half a mile from me called the Family Business Brewing Company. And it is a microbrew that's a, it's got some pretty tasty beer. I'm more of a beer guy, a microbrew guy myself. Now, there there is a winery that is uh, not far uh, from where I live as well. It's um, off of Fitzhugh Road, and it's also near uh, a place that I would recommend that it isn't a winery, uh, but it uh, it's called Revolution Distillery, as I recall, and they make an amazing locally produced gin that is quite fantastic. Uses some ingredients from the uh, from the local area, and I think the uh, the name of the winery that I've been to a couple of times is uh, Solario, and and that is a, a fun little place. Although I think you know it's actually probably relatively large because almost everything is bigger in Texas, right? So it's Solaro, pardon me, Solaro Estate Winery. Uh, is the place. That's about four or five miles from where I live. And uh, I've enjoyed their selection the times that I've been there. Thanks so much, Chuck. Thanks to our guest, Chuck DeVore from the Texas Public Policy Foundation. To find out more about his work at TPPF, visit texaspolicy.com. Also, don't forget to check out PRI's website at our blog, Right by the Bay, at pacificresearch.org. If you like this episode, please tell your friends and subscribe to PRI's podcast at iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or TuneIn. And please do us a favor and give us five stars. You can also listen to our podcast on PRI's YouTube page, youtube.com slash pacificresearch1. That's the number one. Thanks for listening. I'm Rowena Ichon. We hope you'll come back again for another episode of PRI's podcast.